Tech Matters event today. Uh, I'm Giuseppe Porcaro, the Head of Communications of uh, Bruegel. And uh, it is uh, quite of uh, um, more a typical event than uh, we usually have, uh, because uh, instead of being focusing on economics and economic policy, which is our uh, bread and butter uh, every, every day, uh, we are going to reflect on the role of think tanks. And uh, the reason why we are doing this today specifically is because uh, uh, we have the release of the worldwide release of the global go to think tank uh, ranking, which is uh, an annual uh, ranking that is uh, produced by the University of Pennsylvania, uh, basically rating uh, worldwide uh, the per performance or like the ranking of think tanks in different areas. Uh, it's not so much for uh, commenting on that sort of beauty context that we are doing this event, but it's more because the release of uh, that report uh, puts to the spotlight think tanks and their role and also allows us to make a reflection about which is our role in the current political environment as uh, uh, organizations that uh, try through research to make an impact on policymaking. And this year we have a specific theme which is linked to many things that are happening around us outside our different bubbles, which is why facts and think tank matter. So not only about our broader role, but also specifically looking at uh, fact checking and uh, how facts are, to a certain extent, the fundamental uh, aspects of any evidence-based policymaking and uh, any kind of uh, scientific research which, uh, which wants to be, you know, as it is. And uh, I'm very happy to introduce my guests today. Uh, we have uh, Tommaso Canetta from, uh, from Italy, uh, from Milano, uh, coming from Pagella Politica. Pagella Politica is a, a fact-checking a, fact agency. So he will bring us the uh, perspective from, uh, from, from that side of, uh, of the story in terms of facts. But I also have uh, Sophie Gaston uh, coming from the UK. Sophie is the director of the Center uh, for Social and Political Risk based at the Henry Jackson Society in London. And uh, we have uh, Stephanie Weiss from uh, Bethesman Stiftung, uh, based here in, um, in Brussels at, uh, at the office of, uh, of Bethesman, who is a longstanding uh, uh, habitué of, uh, of our events as well here. At, at Bruegel. So uh, with, with no further ado, uh, the goal of, of this conversation, which I hope is going to be quite interactive, uh, is to first of all explore a little bit the wider aspects that, uh, that we have on the table. So first of all, have a look about uh, uh, the relevance that we have uh, in these relations between facts and think tanks today. We are seeing a lot of, uh, of things in the news uh, and in the political uh, uh, discourse which are somehow or uh, s sometimes contradicting uh, the importance of the use of facts. I mean, this is uh, uh, not something that uh, uh, should be new for all of you. Uh, an appeal to opinions and emotions is um, sometimes more important than an appeal to facts or even uh, debunking fake news sometimes is not very effective because people uh, at the end of the day say, yeah, but it doesn't really matter if it's real or not. What matters is the emotion that is underlying and the fact that this emotion is true among the people. Also, uh, in general, comparing uh, a little bit the perception that we have of think tanks, of course, think tanks sometimes could be seen as a little bit obscure agencies. There was a um, a survey made uh, uh, a few months ago in the UK that, uh, that says that only half of the UK people uh, know what think tanks uh, uh, do and are. Uh, and uh, another, uh, the same, uh, the, the same uh, survey also say that one in four do not trust what think tanks say and over half don't know whether to trust or not. So uh, on the eve uh, of the European elections as well, I think that uh, we, we are, I mean, at least at Bruegel, but I imagine 
also at other think tanks here in Brussels and beyond, we are really reflecting on our role, on our contribution in the political debate, on the impact that we can make, and, uh, and many other, some sort of existential questions around, uh, around the role of think tanks and around the future of our, of our role in society. And on this, I would like to, to give the floor to Stephanie to, uh, to reflect on, on that broad issue and uh, broad uh, existential question slash crisis. Many thanks. I will give it a try. And I would like to first apologize for my English. I hope that doesn't give reason to the Englishman here in the room to leave the EU. But anyhow, <laughs> I would say it would have an effectual base. <laughs> uh, so um, indeed, um, I would like to, s to become a little bit more general and step back. When I first read the title, Why Facts and Think Tanks Matter, which um, is not with a question mark, more with an acclamation mark, and in a way it is an assertion, I, uh, my first reaction was, okay, in what times do we live that we are, have to ask ourselves the question, why do fact, facts matter? I don't want to be broadened to think tanks, but <laughs> I want to concentrate on, on the questions. Why do we have to ask this question? And um, the other thing, or, or the second thought, which come to my mind was um, <coughs> that uh, one possible reason is, of course, uh, that um, our body of belief, or what you s could say our conception of the world, um, um, that um, these progressive, prosperous, um, order of liberal democracy uh, will, so to speak, uninterruptedly expand and will become the uh, global feature is threatened and challenged. And it is um, threatened and challenged. I mean, there are many of threats and challenge, but it's among threatened and challenged by a resurgence of what we call far-right populism or nationalism. And it is, I, I guess, evenly threatened um, by uh, China, which thrives and is not a liberal democracy. And we have to take this into account. Um, uh, although, and, and it has, of course, this another size and power than Singapore, which was uh, the other example of uh, a lively environment uh, possible without uh, liberal democracy. Uh, so for me, accordingly, the questions would be, what are the facts that do not matter for um, far-right nationalists or for China, which are so dear to our heart? And the other question is, um, why <laughs> do they not matter for them? And I think this sets in a way the framework, um, why do the facts not matter for them? Um, and that brings me, um, and I have to apologize again because my real background is that um, of someone who has studied Kant for quite some while, <laughs> is that <laughs> the bigger question is, of course, are facts facts? <laughs> and uh, do they um, give us any hints about what is true? Uh, um, although the definition is that this is a true belief, a fact. <coughs> that, that, that is a very difficult topic. And, and thus, um, to get out of that, I would uh, think that we have to admit um, that our worldview and what we deem to be facts is driven uh, by convictions. Uh, and these, these convictions are difficult to base them on evidence. And, and, and one, and I think um, the most valuable um, conviction we shared within liberal democracy, um, I think is that the, um, and I have to, to read this because my English is so bad, the dignity of man is unimpeachable. And I think 
there we should start within our discussions and um, and and uh, uh, with populists and all sorts of others who are uh, not sharing our world view. Um, but on the other hand, I think we have also to admit, and I think there we can become much better, and maybe there's also a reason why facts don't matter, is that we haven't lived up very good to this conviction that the dignity of men is unimpeachable ourselves. And I think uh, one um, <coughs> especially important development is um, the constant um, economization of all walks of life. Um, that uh, a fierce competition that they put a price tag on everything, uh, that we never, um, but never put a price tag on the externalities we, we produce. And um, uh, on top, that um, we ourselves denied facts, but will, and this is also true for the think tech world because we are children of our time, we're more or less um, talking uh, and researching on uh, marketing instruments and framing, as it is now, uh, now called, uh, the truth. But either there is a truth or we frame truth because it serves our purposes. And um, this is what I want to put uh, at the beginning um, of my little, little tour de horizon. And regards Brussels, I'm part of that Brussels bubble now for 10 years and in the think tank world for much longer. I mean, here we see uh, that um, um, there is always this crisis mood. And with the upcoming European elections, we are again in the most important crisis. And we are writing about, you know, how difficult this has become. Of course, this is also self-serving because that gives think tanks a role. Huh? Uh, and the more we write on how huge this crisis will be, um, and the more floor we give to um, those who threaten our liberal uh, order, um, the more counterproductive I feel is what we do. And the second observation is, and, and, and the foundation, in a way, draw the consequences. In a way, um, politics is made in the member states um, and, and to a lesser extent in Brussels. So I'm, in a way, the last uh, standing woman for the foundation <laughs> in Brussels because uh, we be become of the opinion that is much better to squeeze with our resources, our own government at home on European policy than it is um, to preach in Brussels the so-called convicted. And I want to stop here. And whoever takes the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I think that your reflection, first of all, which uh, went quite philosophical, but it's very uh, the very foundation of the debate that we want to have here, it's uh, the issue of convictions. I think that this is uh, an extremely uh, important point that we will have to come back uh, in our... Yeah, exactly. Convictions as, as some sort of uh, value system slash systems of beliefs, which is something that is much more uh, deep than just simple opinions. So, and uh, how the convictions that we have are based or not based on facts. This is something that uh, we will perhaps uh, uh, come back later. And the other, the other point that you, you were making, which is uh, a little bit more on the, on the new, I mean, not on the new cycle, but more on the actual historical moment we are living in, the fact that um, uh, in, in terms of European, uh, um, the influence on European politics, uh, some, uh, some agencies, some think tanks or foundations are actually turning the, not turning the back to, to Brussels uh, and to the building that is just uh, in, in front of you and on our back, uh, but basically uh, looking more at the national level, uh, it's something that it's uh, uh, somehow uh, 
key at the moment to interpret what is going on at the European level. And, and I obviously here uh, look at Sophie because she comes from the UK and uh, that's the country where that um, not only looked back to, to London but basically say, <coughs> saying goodbye to, um, to the EU. And uh, the country where the use of uh, uh, facts or, or, or uh, uh, yeah, interpretation, uh, liberal views of facts within, within the political debate has been key. Uh, probably uh, is one of the best examples together with the US and then we are going to see with Italy all over the world of what has been going on in the, in the past few years. So I, I, I would like to, I mean, before I was just mentioning that, uh, that uh, in the UK only uh, half of people knows vaguely what the think tank is, I would like to, uh, to hear from you your perspective on um, what is going on on the ground in the UK, what is the feeling about, about all this, and uh, broader, more broader as well, the same question about Europe and about, uh, about how this is seen from another point of view. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I think if we're talking about facts as a sort of initial crisis, really what we're talking about is citizens' trust in evidence, and then implicit with that, we are also talking about um, citizens' trust in government as a vehicle to deliver or have an authoritarian, authoritarian position over that evidence. Um, and I think the point of crisis is uh, where this strays into a kind of active mistrust. Um, I started a program of work around conspiracy theories, which I think are the kind of next frontier of where this sort of fake news, contested evidence space is, is going. Um, it's already quite endemic in pretty much most Western political cultures in various forms. <laughs> it's, it's quite nationally specific in the UK. For example, I think um, immigration is one of the most um, potent areas of, of conspiratorial thinking. Um, in France, is this sense that there is a kind of endemic level of corruption with the government. Um, Germany, this sort of sense of obfuscation, which is spun out of the migration crisis. Um, <coughs> And so I think this is really, you know, when we talk about why this is dangerous, this is the end point, this is the standing on the precipice of where this could take us all, uh, could take us. Um, I think we have to be careful because we often, um, when we're talking about facts, we often stray into this facts versus perceptions dichotomy. And I think that can be quite condescending and also quite dangerous. Um, if we go back to this point around um, immigration in the UK, about once every six months a survey will be done uh, that will try to demonstrate this gap between perceptions and reality um, in people's views about immigration. And it will find, for example, that uh, the proportion of immigrants in the country is actually, say, 9%, but people extrapolate out and think that it's 20%. And then there'll be a slew of um, articles in the liberal media uh, <laughs> effectively mocking citizens for this misjudgment and saying, how can, you know, gosh, our democracy is in crisis because, you know, Brits think there are twice as many immigrants in the country as there are. Well, if we actually think about how someone is going about answering that survey, they're basing that on their judgment. So from their own lived experience, from the media, the, the representations they see on the television, um, the stories they read in the paper, and just their day-to-day -day interactions. And maybe someone who has responded to that survey has um, <coughs> taken a bus where they've heard people speaking Polish, they've um, gone to the corner shop and they've been served by um, you know, the Pakistani man who owns that shop and so on. And then so when they're sitting down to answer this survey, they sort of extrapolate out and they think, well, um, I guess it's about 20%, probably about a fifth of the people that I've interacted today. But this is the point around facts versus reality. The reason we say, okay, well, there's 9% nine, 9 or whatever the exact figure is, is because we have a very specific definition of immigrant. By that, we actually mean foreign-born. Now, 
as, as, as an ordinary person who has not necessarily spoken or interacted with all of these people on which they've made this judgment, um, you know, they haven't gone up to that, uh, you know, to the people speaking behind them in the bus and said, are you a first generation immigrant or a second generation immigrant or a third generation immigrant, you know? Um, so I think that's an example of where we can use facts in a quite unproductive way in our political cultures. Um, and I don't think we really gain anything by mocking citizens for having those sort of misperceptions. That is not to say that it's totally that we should not be concerned about many other misconceptions and the flagrant misuse of evidence. Um, I think something that comes, this point comes back to as well is that we also need to acknowledge that you know, citizens' views are shaped and mediated, and we are also people involved in shaping and mediating them. I mean, they don't just sort of wake up of a morning and you know, have these perceptions just come, come out of thin air. If we are despairing at, um, at the misconceptions. I, I think, you know, coming back to Stephanie's point, you know, we think, need to think about our own role and responsibility in shaping them. Um, I think something that has been very striking for me with Brexit, um, after a very long period of kind of political malaise, I mean, the 2005 election, for example, was just catastrophically low turnout, historically low turnout in Britain, and we sort of had this huge period of disengagement. Um, you know, the thing about Brexit is it's really shown how influential our politicians and our media actually are. Um, I was just on uh, Sunday, I was up in sort of the outskirts of Manchester, um, where we were doing a kind of, a, I guess a, a, there was a sort of citizens assembly there, and you know, there was a chap there who's um, all for leaving with no deal. And the lines that he was spouting back to me when we were sort of debating this um, were absolutely verbatim things that, you know, the headlines on the Daily Mail, you know, six months ago, or uh, Boris Johnson gave a speech two weeks ago, you know, I mean, these things about the German car makers and so on. I mean, all of these um, phrases come up again and again and again. And I think it is important to remember as we are sort of constantly grappling, grappling with this sense of, oh gosh, you know, trust in politics is so low. Um, I think MPs are not trusted, but they're still being followed um, and their words and their actions are still um, influential. Similarly, I think evidence is still trusted, but it's just actually we have a quite um, profound distinction that is being made between whose voices are legitimate and illegitimate. So um, this chap is absolutely trusting evidence because he's seen some, you know, there was some uh, partisan think tank report that ends up influencing a story which ended up in the Daily Mail, which was then, you know, picked up on by, you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg or so on, who, who gave a speech. And he, this is where this line has come from. So he is trusting that that evidence is correct. He was absolutely paramount. Um, it, it was absolutely paramount to him that this was correct. Um, but, you know, for him, the BBC or... Um, the Guardian or, you know, many other sources um, are seen to be illegitimate. That evidence is illegitimate. Um, something I should also point out is that a new survey just came out last week which um, measured the uh, knowledge of leavers and remainers about the EU. So at this point, you know, two and a half years on since the referendum, and actually their level of knowledge is quite even, um, between the two groups, and again, that is a kind of common trope um, that sort of leaders didn't know what they were voting for. Well, it's very different to polling people ahead of the referendum, we're two and a half years in. But what was interesting to me was that their knowledge was actually quite split between different issues. So what they were very knowledgeable about the issues that suited their interests, so the facts that reinforce their own beliefs. Um, so what we're actually missing is this common ground of shared evidence base, which used to be quite critical to the functioning of our society. Um, I think we also, you know, we talk about convictions. Um, we need to remember as well that people are motivated now by things <coughs> other than simply knowledge or, or facts. Um, you know, it used to be a known known that you could not win a, an election in Britain without leading on a perception of economic competence. Uh, now people are willing <coughs> to actually um, 
actively make themselves poorer in order to um, securitize their cultural interests. So I think, um, where does this all leave us? Well, actually in the UK, trust in academia, um, in science, in even the civil service remains relatively high. Um, it's pretty abysmal for MPs and, and especially the media, which I think is the, probably the lowest in the developed world. Um, but, you know, then as I say, individual citizens are trusting the sources that reinforce their own not only interests but but their convictions and identity positions so i think we are you know if we take a step back again we've really entrenched a level of partisanship in our politics and i think we've lost the capacity to seek losers consent which is this sort of um a, something that we sort of didn't know that we used to have um but it's effectively that if you win an election, you're sort of actually trying, the, the losers, you're trying to bring them on board in some way, whether consciously or subconsciously. Um, so what this has given way to is now this sort of very heightened sense of threat and defensiveness and, and risk in our political culture. So I think think tanks can feed into this divide and this partisanship. Um, when we're talking about think tanks influence, we're really talking about our relationship with the media and uh, because the media is the, the primary function through which think tanks work is disseminated. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's been a very sclerotic media environment for the past few years. It's, there's a lot of good work that hasn't received the attention that it should have received. And at the same time, there also can be this very alluring um, prospect of actually feeding into this very dynamic environment at the moment um, for a kind of short-term gain. Um, I would come back to this question of um, what our role should be moving forward, um, given that I don't think we're going to have some kind of system-level correction back to where we were before. I think the old model is, is gone. Something new will be forged out of this. Um, and the question for think tanks is who, you know, how can we help our stakeholders, whether that's government and whether actually thinking more expansively, we should be not just thinking about governments or institutions as, as our primary stakeholders, but also the other big forces that shape our lives like tech companies and, and the private sector and so on. Um, how can we help them to do their job better and govern more effectively? So that's where I think we should be thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, uh, for uh, this very in-depth uh, dive into uh, the UK, uh, but also a further step into the broader philosophical question that, uh, that um, Stephanie launched about convictions, because I think that you brought it uh, to a further step in terms of, um, in terms of uh, analysis when, I mean, at least the way I've been uh, reading what you say, when you ma uh, made a further connection with the identity and how uh, convictions reinforce identity and how facts can be used selectively in order to reinforce uh, the identity of, of, of someone. And that becomes like the stakes uh, becomes much more uh, high than when it's simply about uh, is this facts wrong or, or right? And um, the other part, which um, which I found it uh, very interesting, and that uh, bridges us to uh, to to speak with Tommaso, is uh, the fact on how this uh, uh, experience of the evidence it's something that is very subjective. So uh, uh, it needs to correspond to the life experience in order to be connectable. So as you said, you know if the person goes to the Pakistani uh, night shop or uh, goes in the bus and, and sees someone speaking in Polish and, and, and you name it, basically their life experience doesn't correspond necessarily to something that they read in The Guardian, but they, it corresponds to something that uh, Boris Johnson might say, may be saying. Uh, which brings me to the issue that you were mentioning, one which is the role of the media, but on the other hand, and here look at Tommaso, which is the role of the politicians in uh, uh, fueling uh, certain discourse and using selectively uh, facts and figures for, uh, for their own uh, uh, sake. Uh, 
if we can say so. Uh, so maybe Tommaso can tell us a little bit more about the work yeah, that they are doing on this in, course, in Italy. Of course. I would like to follow up what uh, Sophie said about we, it's not right to patronize people, their beliefs are wrong, uh, it's not right and it's not probably useful. But what I think is right, uh, and uh, sadly it's not useful, not till now, it's uh, checking the political statements of politicians because they have uh, a big role in spreading this false news and uh, false information. And also the media have uh, some responsibility at some degrees to just you know, quote the statement of the politician without checking if it's true or not what he's saying. Uh, I would like to give uh, two examples about uh, Italy. In the recent months, uh, the government uh, uh, has approved uh, the main uh, flag uh, measure of one of the two parties uh, forming the government, the Five Star Movement, uh, which is called the Citizenship Income, which is a sort of base income. And uh, calling it citizenship create the illusion in the population that uh, it was only for citizens, not for foreigners. We immediately, immediately checked this, uh, this statement saying it's, it's not possible for our constitution, for the European treaties, you cannot do that. And they ignored us and so the lies went on for months and months and months until now they passed this law and of course foreigners are included because they, can't, uh, didn't, uh, they couldn't do any, anything uh, different. But in the meantime was spread uh, I would like to say a xenophobic sentiment in the population, and it was spread by politicians and media. And uh, another example of the same kind is uh, the other party of the government, uh, Lega, of Salvini. Salvini said very often that he cannot care that much about migrants because he has to care about five million Italians that are poor. And the five million figures is a well-known uh, data but uh, it's wrong uh, connecting it only to Italians. There are 5 million people who live under the line of poverty in Italy, but only 3.2 of them are Italians, the others are foreigners. But keep saying that 5 million Italians poor are his priority, is again spreading this uh, undertrace racism and xenophobia. And this creates a hostile environment for the, you know, receiving the facts and data that we fact check every day because every day we take one political statement and fact check it. So we fight the same fight, I think, and we have the same problems because we also ask ourselves if the readers find uh, our work often quite complicated and too much detail, then they don't want to read all the stuff that we wrote, of course, and the politician ignores us and the journalist do not exploit our work to hold the politicians accountable. What can we do? We are, you know, keep growing. We are actually, uh, we are expanding our team. We, are have, uh, we have um, many different uh, uh, clients, like a news agency, Facebook, uh, television, and we hope that, you know, keeping uh, uh, the, the attention high on the lies of the politicians of all parties, of course, not only the one at the government right now, because we have, of course, to be perceived as impartial, and we are, we have peer review in turn to guarantee that our work is uh, always neutral. It's probably the best way, but still, uh, playing on the emotion, I don't, I don't know if that can work, I don't know, because uh, at some point you um, run the risk to put at the same <laughs> level emotions and facts, opinions and data, and this is exactly what the movements and uh, the politicians who exploit the, the false news are doing. So I, I don't want to, you know, play that at their own game. Good. So, to follow up to this, because you, you're saying uh, facts and emotions shouldn't be put on the same level. But then when it comes to political vision and uh, policy proposals, which is uh, the role of think tanks, uh, when you know, to, to base our research in order to, to make some policy proposals. Uh, the question of, uh, of vision and the question of opinion comes back into the, into the discussion because at the end of the day, uh, you, you need to give a vision that is broader than just a fact. And uh, my question, and also a little bit of a follow-up question to, to the three of you, is how 
you reconciliate these two sides. Because at the end of the day, if you want to make politics, you need to appeal to the emotions of people. You cannot just be a pure uh, technocratic person that is just uh, providing numbers or a statistician that is just saying this is the statistic for this, uh, for this or that. You need to provide a vision that, uh, that speaks to the hearts of the people. And for us, think tankers, of course, the challenge is how do we keep that relevance of bridging between research facts and possible visions for the future of society? I know it's, uh, it's still in the philosophical level of the, of the questions, but what do you think? I mean, how, how we can combine these two things? And this perhaps is one of the keys in order to, to uh, uh, start to bridge the life experience of the person, what Sophie was saying, with the, you know, and, and start also to reflect what kind of facts we, uh, we want to, to display or how do we want to explain the facts to, uh, yeah, to the people. Of yeah. Like yeah, it's a, an open a question. Yeah. Uh, I think that we cannot overestimate, as fact checkers, I cannot think, uh, yeah. speak about think tankers, of course, but as fact checkers, we cannot overestimate ourselves too much. Of course, false news, the so-called fake news, is a huge problem, okay? But I don't think it's the origin of the problem. I mean, the populists and the anti-system forces are not gaining ground in Europe because of the false news. They, I think they are um, both results of other problems that the politicians should infect, and infecting the, the roots of the problem, then you can have uh, that change in also the perception of uh, authorities uh, like uh, traditional media, well-known, uh, you know, uh, media impartial or um, political forces who are not uh, spreading false news, etc. But we have to attack the root, and I don't think that is our work as fact-checkers. I think that that is a work for politicians that could be advised, of course, by facts and data, but this is advising them. It's not solving their problem, right? Yeah, but well, coming to the think tanks, because what I'm a little bit worried is that politicians are listening more to uh, uh, digital marketing agencies that are trying to measure the level of fears of the population on certain topics, rather than to uh, think tankers who might have done some concrete research on, uh, on, on a policy issue and their impact on society. So, I mean, that is another logic they are playing to. I mean, they are not playing to the logic of um, what is um, the evidence, but how um, uh, I get the power and how do I stay in power. And that means um, to, to draw voters on their side. <laughs> and they are not um, relying um, on drawing waters on their side with facts. But it's a much better thing to do this with emotion, as we know from, and that's why I was drawing attention to the economization of all walks of life, um, as we uh, know from, um, uh, from all the, the studies done on our consumer behavior and so on. And I mean, I, I, I found also enlightening in a way for our discussion is when, when you said um, that evidence is not, although this is in, in the definition of Oxford Dictionary, you know, so to speak, um, uh, the available body, body of all our true beliefs, this is evidence, you know, you say it's not, not a question of if this evidence is correct, true or wrong, but if it is legitimate or illegitimate. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, then uh, we really have to think um, again if facts really matter, you know, <laughs> they don't matter, and so, um, uh, or they at least uh, um, matter to a lesser and lesser extent, and that's why I was uh, asking that we should uh, should not um, be confused um, when think tanks said we are working on facts, uh, but maybe we should be more um, forthcoming and say, okay, here are a bunch of convictions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and these convictions <laughs> uh, we try to further um, and also we would wish that our politicians uh, <laughs> go back uh, and have some convictions and not just merely uh, think about um, how in the case of the Eton boys in your <laughs> country um, uh, runs better, better for prime minister Cameron or 
his buddy Boris Johnson and whatever the subject or the fact or the matter is. I think um, we had come to see emotions as a sort of campaigning tool and I think in this sort of populist age we are still sort of ascribing a kind of campaigning element to them but I actually think that one of the clearest findings from the past everything that's been going on over the past three four years is that actually emotions are a critical instrument of governance and what we became particularly poor at um at expressing um, in terms of political communication in the sort of technocratic age that we had come to um, are these things that are actually, it turns out, very important to people. And, you know, culture and values and identity and traditions, um, you know, these, these things, are they come up in every single focus group that I do, and they're not necessarily exclusionary or nefarious. And actually, they're the underpinnings of democratic societies. They're the underpinnings of citizenship. Um, and I think we became so ill-equipped to engage with this. We actually forgot the language of these kinds of issues because we sort of thought we'd moved beyond them or they, they were somehow kind of demoted um, in, in our style of governance. Um, but I think, you know, emotions can be harnessed in a positive way if you go back to Tony Blair in 97, I mean, that was such a positive campaign. Um, and, and certainly those early years were a very sort of positive style of governance. Um, you know, it, we seem to have sort of framed emotions as a kind of pejorative uh, in this dichotomy against facts being sort of facts as the, you know, this existential quality of our democracy. Well, actually, emotions are just as important. And I think, for example, um, you know, it is. It it should not be impossible for us to acknowledge the fears of citizens. That is absolutely distinct from, you know, kowtowing or capitulating to those fears, or feeding those fears, or capitalizing on them, and 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 helping to, kind of, be involved in a, a catalyzing process of those fears. I mean, you 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 can acknowledge them. So I think actually we need to help mainstream politicians engage more with emotions, but. You know, it's more about understanding than about kind of adopting this uh, kind of uh, this populist framework where, where fear becomes the central axis. Yeah, no, I, I do agree. I, I think that you can fight emotions with emotions, not with data. Of course, you can found your emotions on data. It would be better. But for <coughs> example, if uh, at some point uh, the prevalent emotion is fear, you can probably fight it with hope, not with the data. No, your fear is not really well-based. That wouldn't work, I think. So yeah. our work on facts, it's absolutely important, but it's not the right mean to fight this fight. So we should get more psychologists into uh, our think tanks. Or like bringing behavioral studies within uh, within the, yeah. the, the presentation of evidence-based policies Absolutely. and how to connect with them. Well, I would like to open the floor to see if there is some uh, reflections from, uh, from the audience. I see Scarlett over there. Yeah, we should have microphones. So. No, no, uh, for the live stream, it's, it would be good to have the microphone. to break the ice. Does it work? Yeah. So um, I'm Scarlett Varga, I'm from Bruegel, and a very quick question, because um, you spoke a lot about uh, feelings, emotions, and uh, I think these days, uh, these are very important elements in how we, how we talk to policymakers and to citizens as well. But I work in a think tank, and for us, you know, the technocratic thinking is still very important, so we want to find our way as well on how to do things right, and I very much agree with Sophie that I think we will find out soon how we will need to transform, because transformation is needed. I absolutely agree. Um, so I'm thinking, how can maybe think tanks work better together? Because I do see a certain competition um, between different think tanks in different countries, different sectors. Um, and I think there are certain reasons for that. Uh, we don't have to go into that now. But maybe the times that we live in can give an opportunity for us to work better together. And I, I feel that 
we are maybe on the right track in some cases, but how do you think, as experts in different fields, um, that we should or we could do this better? And maybe, you know, teaming up um, psychologists with eco economists could be one way, but, you know, what do you think about that? Thank you. Is there some more questions we'd like to take? Yeah, one, two. Thank you very much. My, my name is Alan Bowman. I, I work at the Mission of Canada to the, to the EU. And uh, the reason I was interested in this panel is in my old job in the foreign ministry, I used to work in our policy research division, and, I, and we, we would try to build bridges between think tanks and government. You know, it, it, was, it was the bread and butter of, of, of what I was doing. And, um, and I have to say, uh, when you think about, and I have many friends in think tanks these days as a result of that, uh, and, and think tanks f uh, um, are... Uh, under two very deep challenges these days, I think. One is the, the audience that you reach is in some ways much more sophisticated. And, um, and I really liked how you opened the, 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 um, the session in, in, talk, in, in asking, are facts facts? Like, what are facts? And, and what is the evidence? And, and what's the methodology? And what is it that you're actually presenting? How credible is it? And I think in an economic, I have an economics background in an economic think tank, it's particularly challenging because your models become contested and, and you have to actually explain assumptions and all kinds of things. And, and it, it, your, your, your communications challenges have, have deeply increased uh, as a result of the sophistication of your audience. But at the same time, these, uh, these echo chambers mean that your audience only wants to hear what, what reinforces their, 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 their beliefs. And that's not new. I mean, people have always been looking for facts that reinforce their beliefs uh, through joining political parties or through the papers that they buy. But now the, the problem is they don't watch the evening news anymore. And they don't read the mainstream papers. So they're not exposed to an alternative point of view. They just want to reinforce. So dealing with those two challenges at the, at the same time is, is very, very challenging. And, and my question for you is, uh, I mean, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you, uh, as, as some say, but, but what, what is it that governments should do? Because we also have a stake in, in, in communicating a message. We, we like to think in Canada that the government, because of the independence or high quality of the, of the civil service, actually produces credible facts, but, but not everybody believes that. And, and in some countries, governments actually uh, pr don't produce uh, facts that, that are all that credible, which is why Canada, as part of its G7 chairmanship, has developed a rapid response mechanism so governments can actually try to intervene quite quickly when governments or other uh, agents try to spread news that can have deep impacts on peace and security or on stability of countries and these types of things. So that's, in our view, one role for, for governments of like-minded, uh, democratic, open-minded nations is to try to fight these things. But beyond that, what is the role of, of government in, in this day and age in ensuring that we have uh, a fact-based debate and are we part of the solution or part of the problem? So sorry for a long question, but I'm really interested in those issues, as you can tell. <coughs> Thank you. I take a last question for this round. Uh, hi, my name is Sonia Afanasiou. I come from the Young European Federalists, and I have a question regarding fact-checking. Uh, don't you think that sometimes fact-checking as a post-factum um, approach doesn't always reach its goal? We know that, for example, when the fake news or disinformation in general is out and it fits into person's worldview and uh, things they believe, it's even if you rebut it with a fact, it still doesn't change. So do you think we should do something before the fake news come out and help people assess uh, information better? Thank you. Okay, I'll answer immediately to that one. Yeah, of course I would like to, but I, I, I don't know how. <laughs> how can we prevent someone to write a blog article and then put it on Facebook and uh, it's completely false. It seems something absolutely unbelievable, but people start believing it and liking it and spreading it. How can we act before something like that happened? I, I, don't, I don't have an answer <laughs> still. And uh, I, I think probably what I was saying, we cannot overestimate ourselves too much. It's that the problem is at, uh, at a higher level. I mean, it's, it's in instruction. It's uh, in uh, perceived uh, economical stability of the, of the people who can trust the system, right? If they trust the system, probably they trust, you know, the traditional news, the traditional media, and uh, they can feel safe about their life. If they feel threatened, they're scared, 
they don't know exactly what, what's going on with globalization, migration, economical crisis, whatever, they maybe are more exposed to believe in something they would like to be true even though it's not. But that's the problem we are discussing. I, I, I seriously, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have a, a solution. I would be a Nobel Prize if I had. <laughs> So I think we can go more on the questions around think tanks and our role, both, both to work together and both towards the government, because I think these yeah. are the two questions that... Um, I mean, um, regards our time, I think with the competition, we are just selling our reports when, uh, in a way, we exaggerate. Uh, when we um, get catchy titles, and uh, if we um, take shelter with doom and gloom scenarios, which isn't helpful um, when that comes to government and looking at the facts. Uh, there was just um, recently a book, um, uh, I think it, it's Rosling Rosling, they were checking um, well-informed audiences on the state of the fair in the world. And, and what turns out is that we all, probably also here in the room, think uh, the state of the world much worse than it really is. Uh, and uh, um, in this belief, it's very difficult <laughs> for governments, even, even if they still have decent civil services <laughs> uh, uh, to react, because they are driven um, uh, by these doomsday scenarios. And I think they think they have to be self-critical we are feeding in too, because we don't sell as journalists. Only a, only a bad news <laughs> is a good news uh, if we don't um, also, sometimes at least, I wouldn't say that is of course not true for Bruegel, but <laughs> um, maybe for others and for us, the foundation, if we, um, um, if we in a way, exaggerate uh, things and just I don't think that, that there is evidence, if this is a body of truth, to that people um, on average um, are showing more solidarity when, when, when we are in a crisis situation. <laughs> so I think um, there is no evidence around that, you know, when it really gets fierce, but people tend to cooperate. They normally then only cooperate more in their narrow uh, social groupings, be it family and so on, but not, you know, uh, with the idea if we all cooperate on this difficult topic, then we are better off. That's unfortunately not one of the wisdoms I have found so far. Um, yeah, I, I, look, there's so many forces that are feeding into this competitive environment between think tanks, um, and in many ways, as I said earlier, they, they're it's easy for think tanks to actually become part of this, uh, you know, very polarized partisanship that we have in our politics at the moment. Um, we are probably not surprised, but in some ways it is surprising that the center right and the center left have been so unwilling to recognize an existential crisis um, in the West. Uh, you know, they're being flanked by the hard left and the hard far right and uh, it, instead of kind of thinking about how to defend those institutions and common positions and um, the respect for, for certain types of, well, even facts and parameters and evidence and, and so on, um, you know, that actually both sides have, have played into this um, partisanship and, and so I think that's been really dispiriting. <laughs> Um, and we see this, you know, still, uh, you know, just in the Brexit votes that we've had this week, actually, the, um, there has been a complete, uh, you know, only, only a handful of Tory MPs who will vote in what they think is the national interest over the party interest. I think that that's still been very clear. Um, in terms of the role of govern governments, um, you know, I've just, I just, before Christmas, published a paper, the, the first piece in this work I'm doing on conspiracy theories, and it was about conspiracy theories about immigration. And obviously, when we talk about this, when the proliferation of these, um, we are so often talking about Trump, and we're talking about Facebook, and we're kind of looking at populists and social media, and 
you know, I think the, my emphasis in this paper is actually at what the traditional parties and mainstream politicians have done to create this incredibly fertile ground for mistrust. And I think, you know, when you actually look back at the kinds of politics that we've had for the past 20 years, you know, in some ways, yes, we've had this kind of golden age of, of progressive, the expansion of social liberalism and, and, you know, economic stability in many ways, actually, you know, and now we've got this sort of dark time of this instability and crisis, but actually we've laid all the groundwork for everything that's happened now. I mean, this is a steam valve. This is a reaction to everything we created before. And we chipped away at the foundations of our political systems and then are now surprised that they feel weak and fragile. So, I mean, I think the only conclusion that you can make from this is that it's really, it's taken us a generation to get here and it will probably take us a generation to rebuild something constructive out of this. Um, I think we're in a, the, just at the start of a period of quite pro profound, um, prolonged dysfunction um, in, in right across the West. But, you know, I think the only ways that you can start to sort of ebb control back is, is through kind of consistency, efficacy, and, and transparency. And, you know, that is very difficult when you are playing with an the, you know, the playing field has shifted, you know, and every, every incentive at the moment is to actually play into this new reality that we're building that undermines everything that came before. But uh, I think, you know, we have to actually be better than we were before. That's, you know, there's no system correction back to that, but we need to say, actually, we don't want to go back to that because we were dangerous and we had spin, we had spin doctors. We were playing with fire. We actually created... Um, unreasonable expectations and we sold citizens lies and we you know created this environment where facts are feeling nebulous you know it was us we did it all so we need to be better well very optimistic <laughs> conclusions from sophie <laughs> um if i may add something actually to your question to a more practical slash, op not optimistic, but a little bit more practical or uh, utilitaristic approach towards it. Uh, definitely, I think that there should be a, uh, um, a clear understanding of wh what we speak about government when we speak about government. So there is, and there are different roles that needs to be played in terms of all this, uh, according to what is our exception of government. If you speak about government as uh, the state apparatus, that we are speaking about something that goes beyond the political majority of the moment, and we are speaking about something that is in the long term. So, in That's what I meant. yeah, and, and in that in that term, we speak about the the, the infrastructure that should allow those, uh, uh, let's say, the the possibility of different point of views to be able to meet, uh, instead of being uh, uh, isolated in uh, in echo chambers. So as you say, you made a very good example of the fact that people don't watch anymore the news uh, of the evening or, or, or read the mainstream newspapers. Uh, so the question may be that the government in that, in that sense should ask themselves, maybe also together with the think tanks and other media and so on, is how we can build the infrastructure for building back this sort, some sort of agora, you know, which is the, the main sense of what democracy is, where you actually have the different points of views that can be expressed on a way. Let's start all this with privatization of uh, TV. Well, I'm, I'm not sorry going to, to get that. that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but 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 what I mean is like, where where can we get this kind of spaces and shared spaces where it's not uh, uh, me versus uh, you and, and where uh, there is a recognition of the different points of views, which can be backed up by facts instead of saying the facts needs to be challenged just because it's, you know, it's produced by a certain outlet, which means government or means this certain interest. The, the second part is about government seeing as government, like as the actual a political majority that won the elections. And I think we shouldn't forget that exception of government. Sometimes we speak about government in a very, very uh, uh, fluid way. And in this way, we mix everything and all the roles together. While the government, as government in a democracy, should and, and has to be challenged by an opposition. And this opposition should have all the right to be legitimate in the political debate. 
And this is something that we've been seeing less and less, uh, or like we've been seeing more and more constraint being built around what kind of margin of maneuver an opposition should have had in the past 20 years. And I'm, I mean, you mentioned Tony Blair, and he has been a brilliant mastermind about uh, bringing uh, uh, facts and evidence-based policies, but also he has been uh, uh, one of the people that contributed with his own discourse on the dismantling of the uh, um, political uh, differences between uh, uh, left and right and blurring everything towards, towards a unique center, and that's the consequences of this we are paying right now. So not only Tony Blair, but it's many other, many other people across the world that have been doing this. Uh, since the, the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, afterwards. So I think that, as, as Sophie said, we are paying a little bit the consequences of things that have been in motion since uh, probably 30 years or, or more. Now, now we are seeing them. And uh, uh, I think that uh, the state as guarantee of democracy should, should be now uh, take responsibility in order to, to rebuild and, and keep democracy in peace. Uh, and, and this is not an easy task that we have. And we as think tanks, I mean, of course, we have a role to play, hopefully, in order to, uh, to bring the discussion on a, on a, on a certain level. But I, I see that it's going to be very challenging. Can I ask something? <laughs> uh, question about what can government do? Uh, I think that the main field of battle will be schools. We have to teach the kids when they are really, really young uh, to distinguish false news and evidence-based news. Because if we manage to convince uh, millions of Europeans that we are not created by God, but we did descend from monkeys, and this is really unbelievable if you think about Europe in 18th century, with public schools, maybe, maybe we can also teach them how to give the proper value to facts and data and reality and uh, also how to distinguish them, giving, of course, the freedom of opinion. Every, everybody should be free to think whatever he wants to think, but please do it on proper basis. So probably government can do something about this problem acting on instruction and schools. That's my opinion. Because then it means that the government has the money to do so. But what we see is um, that um, uh, public education is, isn't at its best. Uh, we have a huge uh, um, competition with private schools. And my question would be, do you think it is a good idea with Facebook, you know, and you see that all over, is um, uh, funding public schools? Why I mean, not? that's what, what happens. <laughs> I mean, it's all happened to us in the think tank world. Yeah. Okay, but, <laughs> but for, that, for um, example, I yeah. studied Greek no, 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 and Latin in high school, which is super cool. No, I'm but, really happy to have done that, that but the, if they the, have the we money... We have also these changes, you know. Um, uh, we, we are witnessing that, that government, even if that would be a good idea, is just not able to implement these kind of policies because we lost on the public goods. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and, uh, and how will we get back... Uh, uh, if not, you know, Google, Facebook. Okay, uh, no, but gives spending you the more money in public instruction so. is always a, a good thing. Yeah, I, I think. would add to that. I mean, the counterpoint is that actually, you know, from a policy making perspective, uh, you know, the easiest thing you can do as a think tank, actually, if you're developing policy recommendations, is to say this should be taught in schools. Actually, schools, you know, children's education is one of the most effective instruments that policymakers have. Um, because you essentially have a captive audience, right? Mm -hmm. But but all you the research all the research is showing that actually the younger generations are much more adept at, at, at critical thinking and particularly in digital citizenship and and differentiating between sources and scrutinizing and what we have right now is a crisis of adults' education, right? And and what we have come to realize is that actually. Um, that newspapers and, and television and the media is, is actually adult education. And so we have a crisis in media, we have a fundamental crisis in the business model, the commercial viability of, of the media industry in many countries. And you know, this is, this is really where, where we need to be thinking about. And the, but the problem is it, it can't come from the governments. 
Okay, so I have a question go, through. Yeah. Do you think that the adults can be saved, or we have just to wait? <laughs> just wait till they die. Which is that, is that I don't want to be that rude, but <laughs> I, I, I see that your question sparked some. Uh, so, I, I'm sorry. Uh, we need, I'm we need didn't some mean to be rude. <laughs> Cold guys on Backbone Consulting in Germany. I agree what you were saying about the role of opposition. And a question to the colleague uh, from London. <laughs> Do you think that during the debate before the referendum, the opposition fulfilled its role against allegations by Boris Johnson, etc.? Thank you. Um, I take also the other question. Actually, I, I, I'm not that optimistic about the, the, the knowledge of youth. Um, I think the, the, the basic problem that was created by, by uh, things like Twitter and, and, and creating infographs has made people lazy. They don't read no more than 140 characters. So then how can you explain with data what is, uh, what is the right thing? And then linked to, to the role of government, uh, I'm also a public servant, and what are we supposed to, do, supposed to do is to defend and to explain what our political masters say. And that is, in a lot of cases, is window dressing. So that is not really doing or using the right, the right data to explain what has been happening. Uh, it is not about explaining, look, we've taken that choice and explaining why they did so and, they didn't, and why they didn't take other options based on facts and data. So it's more about window dressing than giving real data. Hi, my name is Ruby Green. I'm from ICOM, and I'm from the United States. Um, and something that I'm wondering if you guys just could shed some light on is accessibility of studies of think tanks to people who don't have the level of education that I'm assuming the people in this room have. Um, there's a lot of problems with academic jargon that's used in literature that makes it inaccessible for people who actually need to know what's happening, especially when it comes to voting on different legislatures. I'm coming from definitely opinion from the US, so like voting on like things that, with taxes in my city and like me as an economic major even sometimes not even knowing what is being said in these different laws and wondering how people who don't have the academic background that I do are able to interpret what's happening. So how like, how will think tanks work to make their work accessible for people who don't have the level of education that is often need, needed to read their literature? Okay. Yeah, of course. I mean, we at, uh, at our foundation try in, uh, um, to, uh, to work on different levels. Yeah. But uh, if that makes the thing better, I don't know. Uh, I mean, we try because, uh, I mean, the problem now is, as uh, someone, that uh, there are not so many people, whatever level of education, who like to read <laughs> and do not, uh, um, and go, how you say, um, leave their silos uh, and, and walk around. So <laughs> it's very difficult uh, to say, even if you try to communicate um, and, and uh, more in a language and also with tools um, uh, that that would make it uh, would make the facts uh, available for broader audiences I, I, I think that there is a big issue about which is our target audience as think tanks which is something that uh, we are now in the middle of a big reflection you know our main target audience has been so far the influencers which are the media on one side and the politicians on the other side in order to influence policy making. But this is changing so much, especially on the fact that uh, the traditional media are less and less taken seriously. So how do we rethink our model in terms of impact and our audience, which will have an impact about uh, the kind of language and the kind of products that we will have to uh, uh, you know, transform in order to, uh, to reach out or not reach out? It's, it's the big dilemma that we are having at the moment as, as think tanks. And yeah, I, I don't know if Sophie wants to add something about Boris Johnson as well, uh, and, and, and Corbyn. Yeah, I mean, I, just on that point about think tanks, I think, you know, as Giuseppe mentioned, I, the, the think tank model is that, you know, your oxygen is influence in 
you know, the heart of your political system, whether that's here in Brussels or, or in Westminster or in DC. And, you know, that's how you survive. That's how, because, you know, the kind of work that you're doing, you're striving to have impact. I mean, that's how impact is measured. Um, it's actually not built into the DNA of the ecosystem for impact to be measured on a kind of citizen level. Um, I have been in a think tank where we did think about this a lot. I mean, I do citizen-focused research, so actually I'm with the people, but trying to communicate that up to stakeholders. Um, so that's a kind of different model. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it does come down to, at the moment, media covering it and it being covered, that research being covered in a diverse range of sources. Um, it is an important point, and I do think it may shift over the coming years as, as because the I, I actually don't think that the current think tank market um, is actually fit for purpose. Um, and then on this point around the opposition and the referendum, I mean, you know, it, it, it's important to remember that you know we have a, a, a first past the post political system. So we've got two we've got two big parties, and that's sort of how we do politics. And then we had a binary referendum, which created another two divisions, but they were not. Uh, perfectly equatable with the Conservative and Labour split. So actually the Remain campaign was being run from number 10 by the Conservative Party, um, but backed by a majority of Labour MPs. And then you had people like Tony Blair and Peter Mandelson and Alexander Campbell, sort of the old Blairite wing involved. You had people like Gordon Brown. So, and then you had John Major, you know, old Tory, but, uh, Prime Minister was sort of getting involved. So it was this strange cross-party hodgepodge. Um, it was considerably more dysfunctional than the Leave campaign, which was governed by an ideology and really the, was much more of one party. Um, at, in the Remain campaign, you actually had too many cooks at the top. But <coughs> I think there is a very critical question about the Labour leadership. Um, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn is actually the longest standing Eurosceptic in, in British politics. Um, and, you know, certainly there is a counterfactual that wonders what would have happened if, you know, the party, which is now 70% of, of Labour Party members and, and voters are Remain supporters, if it had actually been led by someone who really wanted to stay in. Um, that is a big question that we will never know the answer um, I certainly think it would have helped, um, <laughs> and it hasn't done any favours for uh, the negotiation since. So it is a tragedy of our times, I think, actually, the fact that at the, this moment of great national crisis, um, we don't have an opposition leader who is as effective at holding the government to account as, as we should have been. I can sus subscribe to that. <laughs> So I would uh, wrap up the conversation and I would like to thank once again our guests for today and all of you for participating to the, call, to the, to the debate and uh, thank you very much and uh, have a nice afternoon. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.